I'd like to welcome folks. And um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for joining us today. Um, this is our fourth of the Virtual Library Le Legislative Days, and it is sponsored by the MLA MSLA uh, Legislative Committee. So we welcome you. Normally we would be up in Boston and at this time we would be passing out our box lunches um, and then ready to roam the halls to capture our legislators. So uh, picture yourself in Boston and hopefully next year we will be there. Um, I would like to take a moment to thank my legislative committee. We have worked very hard to get the attendance up. We actually believe we'll be hitting at least um, 391 by the time we're done, which is a fantastic way of communicating with our legislators. Um, today we have um, 109 people registered. We just finished the North group and that was uh, 119 were registered, 91 attended. Our Western state, uh, part of the state, we had 87 people attending and the Central had 69 people attending. One of, the, one of the people just asked, you won't be seeing your face, uh, but just the panelists will be showing up. And so things will be moving along shortly. I would also like to take a moment um, to thank the legislators, the senators, representatives, and or their aides who are registered. Some will have to pop in and out and we appreciate all their effort. And I know that everyone that I spoke to said how strongly they support libraries, which is always very, very reassuring. So I'd like to thank uh, Betty De Benedictus, uh, who is the aide to Ma Rep. Matt Moratori, um, Gregory Denton, who is the Senate aide to Senator O'Connor, who will be one of our co-hosts today. We have um, from the House of Representatives, Stephen Howitt, and a representative aide to Kathy Lenatra is Christopher Jean. Kathy also will be, um, I do believe she has another commitment and she's planning to come in at the time that we need her. So we appreciate that. Representative Patrick Kearney also will be attending. Um, and I know he has another obligation. Obviously this time is challenging for everyone. Representative Joan Moschino will be here. Of course, Representative Matt Muratori, one of my all-time favorites, um, Senator Patrick O'Connor, uh, Senator Michael Rodriguez, um, and also his representative or aide, uh, Caitlin Rowley. And then we have uh, the aide to Representative Sharos, and you can correct me, uh, Caitlin, if I said that wrong, but uh, Caitlin Wright is joining us. Also Representative Zaros, who is, kind of new to this and I'm hoping next week to be able to reach out and meet with him directly. So we also have um, Matthew Douglas, who's the legislative director for Senator Rausch. So I'm going to ask you that if I missed anyone, um, please add the name to the chat. The people who are attending are not going to be able to see a list like the panelists do. So we plan to include a list afterwards to send that around to give our thank yous. And we sincerely do thank you for coming. Um, before I turn the program to our next speaker, I'd like to just take a moment to reflect upon the challenges of the last year with the pandemic. Uh, as the library director at the Plymouth Public Library, I remember just as we were closing the doors on March 28th, of course, I was the last one to leave the uh, parking lot and looking at my library that I had been there for so many years closed was heartbreaking. Um, and so uh, my whole goal at the time, as is the same with all the other communities and their library directors, the goal is to get the libraries back open to their communities. One of the things that we found was that um, every, every town, every municipality handles the budget, the closings, the layoffs, the furloughs, the budget cuts, the vacancies differently. So there was not one overall, you know, do it this way, do it that way. I, I guess the only thing we really could agree on was quarantine books for 72 hours. Uh, that kind of went on for quite a while. But as the year progressed, uh, we were able to bring people back. We were able to open up for curbside. And please remember, we never truly closed. 
We may have closed the physical buildings, but we were online and we were assisting our, our patrons throughout the entire pandemic with multitude of electronic uh, access. Um, but then as we got curbside going, which everyone just responded to beautifully, then we moved on to reopening the doors to the, to the buildings. Some, some libraries used appointments, some people just kept count. Um, in any event, everyone's goal was to get the libraries open. And as they continue, um, the programming will flourish when the time comes. So we want to make sure that the, our legislators and our community know how important our public libraries and our school libraries and our academic libraries and our special libraries are uh, throughout the Commonwealth. And so we thank you for your support and your attention today. And at this time, I would like to, wait, before I go, I would like to uh, remind you that Senator uh, Susan Moran has just joined us. Uh, the Senator is, is new also as Vinny DiMacito had been our Senator for so many years. I'm very excited to get to meet with Susan uh, after, after I return. And then we also have her aide, Monica Mullen, who's a longtime dear friend from our years of service together. So welcome. Uh, and let me see if I missed anyone else. Ooh, there's a lot going on. Well, I'll get back to you once we get things going. I'd like to turn the program over now to the director of the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, James Lonergan. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here to support state funding for libraries. Thank you to everyone who organized this event. And thank you to our legislators for your continued support of the Commonwealth's libraries, including the budget lines of the MBLC and its affiliates and of the Massachusetts Public Library Construction Program. In the MBLC's new strategic plan, our mission statement stresses our role in leading the statewide system of libraries in order to provide every person in Massachusetts, no matter where they live, with equitable access to outstanding library services. It also stresses our role in advancing innovation and fostering resilience in libraries across the Commonwealth through funding, guidance, partnerships, and the coordination of statewide services. We do this working with our affiliates and partners, the Massachusetts Library System, the Boston Public Library and its role as a library for the Commonwealth, the Perkins and Worcester Talking Book Libraries, the Massachusetts Center for the Book, and the nine automated networks. As you can hopefully see from the fiscal 22 legislative agenda being displayed, we are again focusing on one item this year, our State Aid to Public Libraries line 709501. Thank you to legislators for increasing this line by just over 2 million for this current fiscal year to a total of 12 million. We're requesting an additional $1 million increase for this line for fiscal 22. State Aid to Public Libraries is an annual voluntary program administered by the MBLC that distributes local aid to municipalities. Approximately 99% of the Commonwealth's libraries currently participate. It encourages municipal support and improvement of public library services, bolsters reciprocal resource sharing among libraries, compensates for differences in municipal funding capacities, and offsets costs to libraries that circulate materials to patrons from other certified municipalities. State aid to public libraries is local aid and funds may be used in any way that supports the library and will be essential to help communities both during the COVID-19 crisis and in the economic recovery. It will be particularly important given the difficult budget situation many municipalities are experiencing. During these challenging times, librarians and library staff are helping their patrons to find jobs, to gain new skills through workforce development, to apply for unemployment and other needed benefits, to start and grow small businesses, and to support new educational experiences. Many libraries have also been providing wireless access outside their buildings while they've been either closed to the public or offering limited access. And they will again be a key and sometimes the only source of free community access to the internet when their facilities are fully open to the public again. Recent examples of how libraries use their state aid include updating technology, paying network membership fees, and expanding digital collections. In fact, e-content use per network has gone up over 40% on average since the beginning of the pandemic. 
Libraries that are state aid certified also have access to reciprocal borrowing of over 59 million items from other libraries, to MBLC library construction grants, federal library services and technology act grants funded by the Institute of Exam and Library Services, and to the MBLC's Small Libraries and Networks program, which provides libraries that serve communities with populations under 10,000 with funding to support their network memberships. Our agency's legislative agenda webpage is currently featured on our agency homepage, mblc.state.ma.us, and it includes links to our fiscal 2022 legislative agenda, which is available at mblclegislativeagenda.com, so mblclegislativeagenda, all one word, .com. Fact sheets for each of our affiliates that include updates on how they've responded to the COVID-19 pandemic, the top five reasons you should care about the legislative agenda, the benefits of state aid, and more. We are requesting 3% increases for most of our other lines. However, a larger increase for the Massachusetts Center for the Book, 7,900, which had been level funded from fiscal 2016 through fiscal 2020, just received a much needed increase of $25,000 for this current fiscal year. On the capital side, Thank you to the governor and thank you legislators for supporting a new bond authorization of 115 million for the Massachusetts Public Library Construction Program, which was approved last August. The new bond will fund the 17 projects on our wait list. We will seek funding to support our next construction grant round for which over 40 municipalities have expressed strong interest in applying in the future. Please tell your legislators your stories about how funding for the MBLC and its affiliates impacts your library users and communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, James. I wanna take a moment to reiterate again how valuable this link is. Uh, in the past, what we would normally do is we would have print printed packets once we had you up at the State House and had our legislative updates. Um, feed you some pastries, then we would be handing out packets. So this year is not a year to, to have print copies, although you're welcome to print anything you need when speaking with your representatives and uh, senators. But please remember that this is uh, where all the information is. So you can arm yourself be beforehand and um, get ready to speak with them intelligently about what we're trying to do here. Advocacy is our goal, and typically we really, our committee really tries to get the library directors, their trustees, their friends, and the public to reach out to their individual legislators. The more who speak, the better. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say uh, that it's now time for Greg Pronovitz, who is the Director of Outreach for Massachusetts Schools of Library Association. Welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. Can you hear me okay out there? Yes, yes we okay. can. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. MSLA is a proud co-sponsor for Library Legislative Day for many years now. MSLA is the professional association for Massachusetts school library teachers. School library teachers uh, are both librarians and certified teachers. We are striving to support equitable access to high quality library services for all students in the Commonwealth to support their achievement. Today, many library teachers have uh, students in their library, classes to teach, so they aren't able to join us today, but I noticed that some were on the registration list. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to all library advocates for joining us today, and thank you especially to elected officials and your aides who joined us today to hear our stories. The MSLA has enthusiastically endorsed the MBLC's library legislative agenda. School libraries benefit from these services in many ways, but I wanted to point out that the online content uh, services provided through these are very important to schools and schools are the heaviest users of state-funded online content such as online journals, scholarly articles, and other reference resources. During the pandemic, during hybrid and remote learning, these were used very heavily by students and families and faculty from home. 
they were used very heavily before the pandemic too um, by students, families, and faculties to support their education. And we expect that after the pandemic, they'll be used heavily too. And we really appreciate the support you've given for them. However, it's clear from usage, usage statistics that school libraries that have certified school library teachers, and not all do, use these services most often. The cost of these services on a statewide level isn't based on how many times they're used or from how many locations they're used. So the libraries that aren't using them are missing out on sort of pre-funded by state appropriations, very valuable services um, that folks don't know about because they don't have a certified library teacher to point them out to them. This use pattern is indicative of inequities to school library services in Massachusetts. A couple of years ago, the Special Commission to Study School Libraries, called by the state legislature, pointed out glaring inequities. The MSLA has been working for two years to ask to have these, the recommendations of that commission implemented. And now that the pandemic is winding down enough to open schools uh, for in-person learning, we think it's time to get back to this and to look at, at the priorities pointed out in that study. Our priority as, the, as our Association of School Library Teachers is not so much of a funding request but we'd like to see the Department of Elementary, Edu Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE, to uh, create a census of school libraries and their services, and to keep that, that census up annually to look at the physical spaces, the staffing, the certification of staffing, the collections and resources, and the uh, budgets for those institutions so that we have, we can track the benefits of school library services in schools because right now, DESE doesn't have a good record of which schools have school libraries, what they're being used for, who's staffing them. We think it's important as a first step in addressing inequities to understand which schools uh, need the most improvement before we can address them properly and we're looking for your support. And we appreciate you being here today, elected officials and your aides, and I thank you. All right, thank you so much, Greg. I'm going to take a moment to just um, add a couple of people who've, who've joined us. <clears throat> Excuse me, the aide, uh, Brandon Cordero for um, Representative Howitt's office, as well as Cooper Leonard for Representative Cutler. I believe I've added in the ones who've joined us. So thank you for uh, participating. Um, before I introduce uh, Senator Patrick O'Connor, I just want to reflect back to how many legislative breakfasts that I attended where he was. He was there, I believe, last year for OCLN. Uh, we had one in Cohasset. Uh, I could be off a year, but I think I'm right. And uh, Senator O'Connor spoke there. And whenever he speaks, it always warms my heart as to uh, what we do with libraries to provide for our families and early literacy and the people in our communities. And so Senator O'Connor is one of those who's dedicated. So at this point, I would like to introduce Senator Patrick O'Connor. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, first off, before I get started, just thank you to all of our librarians and all the people that work in our library systems throughout all the districts that are represented here. Uh, I know that you have, I think the entire slate of legislators from the South Shore to the, the Southeast and into the Cape. So it's great to be joined here by so many of, the, of, of my colleagues. What you've gone through this past year has been um, nothing short of devastating to the system. And I, and I, and you know, we're fully aware of that. And now is the time as we see the light at the end of the tunnel with the COVID vaccine uh, really ramping up as far as the numbers we're able to get of shots in the arms every single day. Now is the time that I think that we transform from our response stage while we're still doing our response to the recovery. And one of the major points of the recovery in, in my point of view, and I know in my colleagues, is to make sure that our library systems are as strong as they can be because of the role that they're going to play in all of our communities. 
to give you a little background and just uh, let you know where I come from when it comes to public libraries. I grew up literally down the street from a public library. It was a great source of not just information, but a huge part of my childhood, being able to walk down to the Tufts library from my house as an early child and ride bikes when I was at that stage and to be able to go there and to utilize the resources of being able to take out a magazine or being able to take out a book and work with, uh, um, you know, here story time when I was a child. Uh, it's just such a huge focal point of me growing up and in my opinion, just a huge resource and center of every single community. One of the more unique things that happened to Weymouth during this period of time was that we were actually able to build a library during this pandemic and, and open a library during this pandemic, which goes to show you the strength and resiliency and the commitment that people in the community have for the service that you provide. I was proud that up at the state level, we were able to, under Chairman Rodriguez's leadership and uh, Chairman Mike Lewitz's leadership, um, but Chairman Rodriguez in particular on the Senate side, and I wanted to let you know that he had reached out to me and he was on here at the beginning and then had to duck away for a meeting, um, but an incredibly busy gentleman uh, with uh, the budget right around the corner and being our chief budget writer and our leader in that regard. You know, being able to increase um, the amounts as James had indicated 11% in the, um, the general appropriation guideline from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 21 for the big line item um, as far as for the Board of Library Commissioners as well as that reauthorization of $115 million to make sure we continue to build new state-of-the-art places of learning and places of culture and libraries throughout the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This year, the 3% increases seem very reasonable uh, and very very doable. Obviously, it's um, it, we're, we're in a point in time right now that the economics are very interesting with the amount of federal stimulus that's going to come our way. and how we work with our local partners and making sure we utilize those dollars as best we possibly can. Um, for those that don't know, the state's about to receive four and a half billion dollars from the federal government and all the municipalities combined are, are going to receive three and a half billion dollars. So in my opinion, this is a real generational opportunity for all of our communities and the Commonwealth to invest in those areas that we've been neglecting. And I see the libraries playing a very important role when it comes especially to our jobs training as well as being able to certify workers in skilled trades. I think that two of those things that the libraries have already been doing very well pre-pandemic, they can really um, utilize and in my opinion capitalize financially um, to be able to get resources to even further those missions. In addition to that, I, I really wanted to point out that the communities as we continue to get these dollars, there's gonna be a strong emphasis on one-time expenditures. So I would really highlight to all the um, library directors on here that that's going to be something that you should prioritize now as far as what the, what the real needs are in one-time expenditures as the communities start getting this money. Guidance and the actual dollars will probably start rolling in sometime in the next month or two. So this is going to be something that um, good planning now with, with, you know, your local boards of selectmen, city councilors, mayors, town administrators, etc. will really play huge dividends in being able to get that money as quickly as we possibly can. I think that in, libraries have never been more important than they are right now. The structure in which we go into them and, and check out books and, you know, not necessarily gather is uh, a, a shift from where, we, where we've been but there is better days that are going to uh, be in front of us. And I, I truly believe that in order to recover and rebuild the best way we possibly can, we need to continue the investment into our public library system. And again, I, I can't thank you enough for all the work that you've been able to do during this incredibly challenging period of time. I know that some places are reopened, but the way that we shifted to curbside pickup and ordering online and all of the things you were able to do to keep that enrichment and keep that activity going, especially for those uh, students who are in uh, settings that they weren't able to return to in school learning, to be able to get those resources has just been um, such a delight to me. And um, I did want to also, uh, I knew you made note of Kathy Lenartra, Representative Lenartra. She had actually reached out to me too. She's um, at a hearing right now as one of the key person, uh, key legislators asking questions. So she's doing that. 
Uh, and again, I just wanted to really promote all of my colleagues that um, we're all in this together. And every single time that we talk about the libraries, there's nothing but positive momentum and movement going there. I know that we're still far away from, uh, with inflation, the numbers of where we should be back in the early 2000s. Cognizant of that fact and understanding of the amount of money that uh, we're about to receive from the federal government, I think now is prime time to make those investments that are necessary into our library systems and bring all of our libraries up to date in infrastructure ways, as well as in their catalogs, and hopefully through further investments into new state-of-the-art facilities like we have in Weymouth and another one that should be opening very soon in Norwell. Uh, so we were very proud that on the South Shore we will be able to get two uh, libraries rebuilt under the last grant and Hingham was actually accepted but due to municipal decisions they decided not to make that investment on their side but hopefully uh, through the next time. I just think it's a fantastic opportunity and despite the challenges we faced we really have a great opportunity right now and I'm so privileged and proud to be part of the library caucus as well as to be an outspoken champion for the libraries uh, on Beacon Hill and in my new role now as the ranking member of Senate Ways and Means being one of the three people from the Senate uh, in the room as we start and develop and eventually negotiate the budget um, to its final version. So thank you again for everything that you do. Thank you to all my colleagues. Um, I know that Jennifer, you've been doing a great job at naming them as they've been coming on. I, I've gone through the, the attendee list and there's so many of them, which really speaks volumes to the amount of respect and appreciation we have for all of you and for all the work that you're doing. So. Stay strong, stay with it. We know that there is, um, there's still a lot of work to do and a lot of things to be funded, uh, but a 3% increase seems um, you know, very reasonable during these periods of times. And I know that we're going to go in really um, hoping to secure as much as we possibly can, given obviously budget constraints and, and knowing that there's federal dollars out there, but hopefully with a, a, a mix and match or, or working of all of them, we can reach the request that you've set forth. And uh, thanks again for having me. Thank you so much, Senator. If, if you don't mind answering a question, um, sure. Sandra Perry had typed in, high-speed broadband for our libraries is critical. Is this type of improvement considered a one-time expense? I would say that it is. And actually, so in addition to the four and a half billion that we're getting from the federal government and the three and a half billion that all the towns combined are getting from the federal government, there's also buckets of money out there through the American Rescue Plan that I think that Massachusetts will be highly competitive at getting. And right. one of them is specifically tailored towards broadband. Talking to my colleagues out in Western Massachusetts and in South, Southern Massachusetts, Southeastern Massachusetts, you, you know that we have issues when it comes to being able to get the most up-to-date broadband infrastructure in place. And so my hope is that we really play hard to compete for those dollars but yes, I would consider them a one-time expense. There's obviously upkeep and other things that need to be part of that, but the initial installation is the big sort of uh, financial driver of why these things aren't put in right now. And I would hope that that's something that we can do at the municipal level, at the state level, and then go after those buckets of money that are out there at the federal level too. Um, thank you for answering that. I know that um, we, we're really not set up to open up to questions, but uh, because I, uh, Representative Lenatra is tied up and she did let us know that that was a, a possibility. You really carried forth for her, so thank you. Uh, she is um, actively involved in the Library Caucus and it turns out that now that I am retired and moved to Plymouth, she's actually, uh, I'm actually in her precinct. So I'm uh, very excited to be able to vote for her and uh, continue to develop my relationship. I bring that up for, for a reason. Um, in the past, we had legislative breakfast. I know I referred to, to you. This year, we, the librarians really did not have the kind of bandwidth to uh, put that together. And we put all our eggs into our legislate, our virtual events this week. Um, but we did have two areas. Uh, CLAMS held their successful legislative breakfast and the Western Massachusetts Library Association, they also held theirs. Um, so. I just wanted to give a shout out to them for that. We hope to move forward in the future. Our committee definitely works on keeping a hand and aware of what's going on with legislative breakfast. We tie it into the budget season. We are very relieved to see that we're almost back to normal on the budget season with the House Ways and Means and how things are moving along, Senator. So, um, and hearing that you're on the Ways and Means, uh, the Senate Ways and Means, that's great. So I hope to see you um, in the upcoming weeks to continue advocacy 
And I hope so that some of this conversation is inspiring directors who, have who are attending that if you're interested in all in, in continuing uh, showing up and letting people know how important it is to support their libraries, you know, contact us to consider or at least attending one of our legislative committee meetings. Um, I think that we'll go ahead and move along and uh, we'll, we'll say hello to Kathy and thank her for thinking of us. Um, at this point, I would like to recognize a couple of our Mass Board of Library Commissioners who are on the line. We have Debbie Conrad is attending, Les Ball is also attending. He's very kind. He's been showing up to each one of them as well as uh, Jan Resnick. So uh, we thank the commissioners for their support. And I would like to now introduce um, Mass Board of Library Commissioner, Marianne Kluggish. Thank you, Jennifer. And a special thank you to so many legislators and their aides for being here today. We really do appreciate it. Senator O'Connor, thank you for really important information and some knowledgeable advice. Well, James Lonergan went through the legislative agenda and there's lots more information on the website. Now it's up to you. Don't let this session be the end of it. Attending today is just the beginning. If you haven't been in touch with your legislators yet, your advocacy should begin now. A few years ago, my state rep told me, if I don't hear from you, I have to figure everything is okay. Think about what that means. There are thousands of competing demands. What message are you passively sending your legislators if you don't contact them? You've seen the legislative agenda. You all know why funding networks is important. You know why the MBLC needs funding and why MLS and delivery and training and what the Library for the Commonwealth does is important. You know how important the talking book libraries at Perkins and Worcester and the Mass Center for the Book are. And the last thing I should need to tell you, the library community, is why state aid to public libraries is vital. It's, but it's your job to tell legislators why library lines are important and what they mean to your library. When I testified at Joint Ways and Means with Director Lonergan this year, he went through each item in the legislative agenda and I focused only on state aid. We are asking for a million dollar increase in state aid this year from 12 to 13 million. One of the things I said at Ways and Means was that local libraries will need more state aid to public libraries funding this year than ever before. When I was through, legislators asked us, how will libraries use that state aid money? So if you're a director or a trustee, or if you know, it's up to you to tell legislators how your library will use state aid. Tell them why you need it. To pay for your network membership, new electronic resources, mobile Wi-Fi hotspots, fundraising, post-COVID related changes to keep the lights on. Legislators need talking points from you to use to advocate with other legislators and tell them why you want them to make state aid line 709501 a priority. Each year your state reps can tell House Ways and Means what their top three priorities are. Over the years I've come to the conclusion that asking someone to just support libraries is like asking them if they support apple pie, motherhood or puppies. You have to ask legislators to make library funding a priority and ask them to tell that to Ways and Means. Don't forget that the total of all of the seven line items in the legislative agenda is no more than 0.07% of the state budget. Not even 0.1%, 0.07%. Libraries do not need big money to be effective, but they do need enough money. So how do you get a legislator's attention for 0.07% of the state budget? There's only one way, by a lot of people being squeaky wheels that get the oil. It's a numbers game. When you go back to your board or staff meetings, get everyone else to write, call, or email their legislators. Every political office counts the number of calls, letters, emails they get for each issue. We've heard telephone calls and letters get more points than emails, but emails are still great. They add up and you can include a link to the MBLC legislative agenda in your emails. Here's another effective thing to do. 
ask your town selectmen, mayor, town managers to tell mass municipal organization to support libraries. MMA is a very powerful organization. You may have heard me say this before, can, but can we set a small goal of each community getting a minimum of just 10 people to call or email their legislators? Just 10 people from each town? Think about it. If you were a legislator and you got 250 emails, calls, cards, notes, letters, asking you to make funding for item X a priority and you got say 12 contacts on libraries, which one are you gonna pay most attention to? Which one would become a priority, especially if those 200 contacts are asking you to make it a priority? We need the active participation of every single person here and more. Democracy is not a spectator sport. It only works with active participation. So please become squeaky wheels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne. Before I let the Senator go, uh, we did have a follow-up question. Um, with the Senators urging that we prioritize one-time expenditures, mm -hmm. do we know how the new library funding is to be slotted and allocated and how that planning should be focused? I will ask James Lonergan to address that, please. So thank you, Jennifer. So um, yeah, what, and what Senator O'Connor talked about, so of course, you know, there's our American Rescue Plan Act funds coming to the Commonwealth, coming for, to municipalities. But we actually got some direct funds from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Uh, $3.5 million is coming to the MBLC. We haven't received it yet, but we will be getting it this month. So uh, I've been in a couple of meetings with my colleagues from the other state library agencies around the country and with the director of the, uh, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, Crosby Kemper and staff. And they've really given us some very initial guidance. We're, we're waiting for more. But their top priority for our using these funds is uh, basically digital inclusion. So that could be hotspots, uh, devices so, such as those. Uh, the second priority is really pandemic response. So uh, we just actually had a board meeting. Uh, the commissioners did last, I think it was last week, losing track of time. And what we've talked about is our very initial thoughts. And we do have a state advisory council on libraries. They'll be providing us input in the coming weeks and, and, and others will as well. Uh, we're, our first thought is to provide statewide uh, hotspots, Chromebooks and other devices. Um, to continue funding e-resources to support schools, job seekers, and summer learning. We've been doing this through the Mass Library System and, and the Boston Public Library, the Library for the Commonwealth. Uh, virtual programming support, we actually use CARES Act funds for that as well. And we've partnered with museums in some cases. We've used it to support online summer learning platform. Uh, the CARES Act funds, we're planning on doing that again with the ARPA funding. Uh, we're looking at IT technical assistance, technology assistance, I should say, for small libraries. And then one of the things we'd really like to be able to do is a statewide assessment of um, public libraries, their HVAC system needs, uh, their the availability of broadband and an ADA accessibility. I should point out, point out these, these are one-time funds. However, we, we're not allowed to use any of this funding towards construction. That's a separate bill that's actually been introduced in the House and Senate, the Build America's Libraries Act, which I think the American Library Association is hoping could be a part of an infrastructure, a larger infrastructure bill, although President Biden's, uh, the, the, what the proposal doesn't yet include that. And the last thing I would mention that we're considering at the moment is um, a limited number of direct subgrants to support digital inclusion efforts and pandemic response, particularly for the hardest hit communities hard, hard to sit by COVID and as, as well that are socioeconomically challenged. So again, very initial days. We haven't actually received the funding yet from IMLS. However, these are, um, and we'll be certainly looking for more input um, and please do suggest things to us. Please uh, feel free to uh, email, call uh, me or my colleagues at the MDLC. Um, so hopefully that helps uh, answer that question. Thank you, James. Um, I do want folks to, to know that with the work that ALA is doing, MLA is um, keeping their finger on the pulse as well as our legislative committee so that uh, you'll be hearing more from us on how, how we can support that process. Um, at this time, I'd like to take a moment to, um, first of all, acknowledge uh, the members who've, who've joined us today, my colleagues from the Old Colony Library Network, 
We had a great uh, turnout and I truly appreciate that. Uh, the very last legislative reception that we held was at the Plymouth Public Library, that the last large event we had at the Plymouth Public Library. It was February 8th, 2020. And we had, um, actually Kathy Lenatra was there, our town manager. We had uh, Commissioner Les Balls. It was um, close to 90 people. It was an evening reception, several OCLN directors joined us. We had it catered and we actually had a little bit of alcohol there, which, which was um, the most fun. But that, that, was my, that was my goal, was to bring a fantastic legislative reception in the 2020, which Plymouth was celebrating its 400th anniversary. And then everything fell apart. But it's so nice to look at all of you today and say, well, we fell apart for a while, but now we're pulling ourselves back together again. And so uh, with that note, I'd like to wish everyone well. If you would like to stay on the line, we're going to have Will Adamzak discuss the Engage uh, product that we have with MLA. And please understand we have discovered there are a few issues, so we're working through them, but feel free to contact us about that. And so those of you who wanna stay on, we're gonna take a little pause. And as other people exit, again, I wanna thank all the legislators um, specifically Senator O'Connell, you really uh, pulled the day for us today. And um, good luck to everyone and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. So we're just going to pause a minute and uh, allow people to uh, log off as, uh, as the meeting's wrapping up here. But uh, I'm Will Adamsick, and I'm uh, going to talk to you just briefly about how you can be an active participant like Commissioner Kluggish mentioned, and how we can help you be the squeaky wheel um, when it comes to advocacy for libraries. MLA subscribes through, uh, through the American Library Association to Engage, which is a, a product that helps advocates, librarians, trustees, friends, uh, and fans reach out to our legislators. Uh, it can be found um, on the Massachusetts Library Association website under the Legislative Committee, but we'll be emailing you a link to it uh, this afternoon after this meeting. This is the Engage page that you would find, um, and there are a number of ways to take action. You can contact via email, you can contact by phone, um, or you can use this Legislative Day 2021 follow-up that we already have ready for you. You would click on Take Action, and it would send you to a form where you would fill it out with your name and your address. And after you do that, it will pop up with your local senator and rep. I, I live in Abington. Um, my library director and the chair of uh, the trustees are here, so hello, Deb and Henry. Um, but these are our representatives and Senator, uh, Senator Keenan and Rep Sullivan. Um, if we put in our local address, it will pop up with this message about supporting the legislative agenda. It will specifically highlight the need for funding state aid to public libraries. Um, but it also allows you um, the flexibility to click in here and put in your own message. I don't know why that happened. Um, so what you do, you put in your own message, you personalize it, and then you hit submit and it sends it off. This is what it would look like, the form you'll have to fill out. It's a simple name, address, um, email. And you have the option again of emailing, but if, as Commissioner Kluggish said, if you wanna be a squeakier wheel and add up a few more points, you can contact via phone. It's the same thing. You put in your, um, your information, it would send you to a page with the phone lines directly to your legislators. This Engage page also provides information that we've heard about already today. Uh, it puts it in one place for you. It links to the uh, MBLC legislative agenda, uh, links to the benefits of state aid and the top five reasons you should care about the MBLC legislative agenda. These are all uh, valuable information. So I would recommend reading up a little bit before you make your call or before you send your email. And again, you have the option of sending our email with, with a message of support, 
there's an option for a blank email and an option for just making a phone call. Um, these are all ways you can be the squeaky wheel. These are all ways you can advocate for library services at a statewide level. And again, this will be coming out in an engaged message, uh, uh, email follow-up after our uh, time together this morning. So thank you, Jennifer. Well, I think we've covered everything. And um, again, I wish everyone well, and we'll see you the next time around. Take care, go call your legislators right now. Thank you.